All right, so let's just begin with a, a kind of abstract summary of what a state is compared to a tribal uh, society. I think there is a, there's at least five characteristics. States, unlike tribes, uh, possess a centralized hierarchical source of authority that is, at least in theory, capable of enforcing uh, rules. Second, uh, that authority is backed by a monopoly of power, a legitimate power, which means that the state can actually coerce you uh, into obeying its rules. And the legitimacy part is, is important. Um, so there are no militias, and there's a general social consensus that uh, the state has the right to exert that power. Th third characteristic, it's uh, states are territorial. Uh, Clovis called himself the king of the Franks, but he did not rule over a state, whereas Louis XIV was the king of France, not of a group of people, but of an actual uh, territory. And one was a tribal society, and the other was, uh, was a state. Uh, fourth characteristic, states are much more uh, stratified and hierarchical. And in, in fact, there's a certain tragedy in human history as you pass from a tribal society that is relatively egalitarian, that chooses its leaders on the basis of a certain kind of consensus and participation. When you move into the era of states, uh, you have the development of things like slavery, uh, of um, uh, you know, absolute powerlessness in the face of uh, these centralized uh, institutions, and you get the uh, first emergence of genuine uh, social classes. And then final characteristic, although you have ancestor worship and other fairly primitive forms of religion in tribal societies, uh, it becomes much more institutionalized once you move to a state level. So even if you stick with ancestor worship, you usually have a, a specialized class, priestly class, uh, that is the custodian uh, of religious belief. Now, what's the difference in the overall pattern of political development? China, as I said, develops a modern state very, very early on in its history, but it never develops rule of law. China is the only world civilization that does not have rule of law, in my sense, because it never has a transcendental religion. So the Chinese always you know, proclaim law, but it's always a positive law. It's always a proclamation of the emperor. Uh, there's never a concept in China that the law is something higher than the state that should restrict what the state itself is able to do. Uh, and having established this very powerful state, they can then prevent the formation of groups that would be opposed to it, like an independent bourgeoisie in cities or a blood nobility or uh, a religious establishment. And so the fact that they go after Falun Gong today follows in a long, very consistent line of opposition uh, to the formation of any civil society, you know, source of authority that they don't, uh, they don't control. Uh, and, and so you get just the state with no uh, accountability and, and no uh, rule of law. In the West, the sequence was actually, it's oftentimes misunderstood because it begins with rule of law, then moves to the development of a strong state, and only at the end uh, do you get um, uh, institutions of accountability. So that the very process of state formation in early modern Europe is done against the background of, of law. Uh, there's this contrast I make in the book. This, my favorite sh character in Chinese history is the evil Empress Wu. She was the only woman in Chinese dynastic history to ever s establish a, uh, a dynasty under her own name as opposed to being a regent for a son or a, a husband. Uh, she did this in this extraordinarily um, uh, ruthless way. Uh, she was a concubine of the second Tang emperor. Uh, she arranged to have her own young daughter brought into the empress's presence and then smothered, and then the crime was blamed on the empress, who was subsequently then dethroned and then, you know, a few years later cut up and stuffed in a wine vat somewhere. And uh, this um, uh, um, consort, Wu, then became the empress. Uh, she killed one of her own sons. She sequestered another one. And she actually managed to kill off a substantial part of the Tang nobility that had opposed her rise uh, to power by the end of the uh, by the end of the sixth century. Uh, and so, you know, the kind of internal power struggles among the elite in China were really not restricted by legal restraints on what uh, people with political power could do to other uh, elites. In Europe, by contrast, there are two big revolts, famous revolts. One was the Comunero revolt against the great Habsburg Emperor Charles V uh, in the 1520s. The other one was this uprising known as the Fronde in France against Louis XIV. Both of these are anti-monarchical revolts by elites, by aristocrats. Uh, they lose the war, and at the end, both of the, the kings pardon their, their noble 
uh, uh, rivals. If this had been a Chinese emperor, they would have been executed, their whole lineages would have been uh, killed off to break the rope of descent. But in Europe, there's, there were constraints. Up until the great totalitarian upheavals of the 20th century, there were very powerful constraints on what people could do in the exercise uh, of power that I think sets up the, the, the present, all right? So this is, the, this is the, the question we have to ask going forward into the future. The Chinese have this extremely efficient authoritarian, high quality authoritarian centralized system, no checks and balances. So if they want to do a stimulus plan or infrastructure investment, they just go ahead and do it.